My name is Gail Woon. I'm a marine biologist and uh, in 1988, I founded an environmental education NGO called Earth Care. And our mission is to teach the public, but mainly youth, about how to save the planet. We are also encouraging students and teachers, if they have an environmental issue that they're concerned about, to write the government and try to use the power of their voice to help change whatever problem they might be interested in. We are on Grand Bahama Island and the city of Freeport is here and we have the West End community and the East End community. You might have heard of us in the news in 2019. Uh, Grand Bahama Island and Abaco were both uh, very devastated by climate change, Hurricane Dorian. And so uh, at that time we got help from the entire world. We had NGOs from as far away as uh, Europe and Africa and everywhere. Everyone came in to help us, which was great because we really, really needed that help. Grand Bahama is parallel to West Palm Beach, Florida. We are 60 miles away from the city of West Palm Beach in Florida. So we are perfectly situated for uh, transport. In fact, we have a, a major harbor. We encourage ecotourists. We encourage people who have environmental concerns to travel to our island because we're blessed with underwater caverns, cave systems. We have bird tourism now. People come here to bird watch. We have five endemic birds that are only seen in the Bahamas. So as environmental educators, I know you are aware of many different habitats. One of the habitats that's very important in the Bahamas is the mangrove ecosystem. And the mangroves are important for many reasons. Uh, firstly, the mangroves are a marine fish nursery. So many of the crabs and shellfish and young fish have their start in the mangrove root areas. So that's very important for our fisheries, as well as they also build land. The red mangrove has a prop root and uh, the waves bring in the sediment, but they can't, the sediment doesn't go back out when the wave goes back out. So these prop roots actually end up building land which is great because usually God only gives you land once. So that's amazing. As well as they're an incredible storm break. If you remember the tsunami of 2004 in the Indo-Pacific, they did some studies in uh, Thailand on the islands there. And the islands that had intact mangroves had much less mortality than the islands that had raised their mangroves and put up hotels on the beach. So that's actually been studied and published peer reviewed. Uh, here you see the red mangroves with their prop roots and their, the way they reach out like little hands. And so the prop roots build land. You can see small fish in here. There's this little barracuda and some smaller fish swimming around, the crabs, the oysters, all sorts of young marine creatures get their start in the mangrove roots. This is the white mangrove, and the white, white mangroves prefer um, less salty environments. So you have red, black, white, and then buttonwood. The buttonwood is, would the, be the one you would find furthest away from the ocean. The mangroves are such an important habitat that we actually have a whole lesson. We just talk about mangroves with our students and then we go out and we do a planting. We collect the propagules and we go out and plant them in, in the area. Dover Sound, we've been doing that for uh, three decades. And mainly as an educational exercise, not as a restoration exercise, just to have fun, let the kids get muddy, and they learn at the same time. Because going out and actually planting a plant in the shore and knowing that it's going to grow up and it's going to protect the island, 
That's a huge lesson for the children. Everyone that I've ever taken out has always told me that that was the one day they really remember, especially when they, they blow out their flip-flops in the, in the mud. I don't know if you can see, but this plant here has a mangrove propagule still attached. The bottom of it is brown and pointed. It's designed for it to be the end that goes into the soil. That's where the roots will come from. And this piece at the top will break off. When, when the propagule is ripe, it'll drop off and it'll have a little pointy thing at the end. And that's where the leaves and the stems will come out of. So it's particularly designed to float. And so most mangroves are on coastlines. So they drop their propagules, the waves take them away and they spread around different areas. This year, EarthCare was able to partner with Waterkeepers Bahamas and the Coral Vida, first land-based coral reef farm on the island and the Blue Action Lab. So four different organizations have joined together and we're headed by Waterkeepers Bahamas. The main reason for this project is to reforest an area called Dover Sound, which is on the north shore of the island, which was uh, our mangrove forest was devastated by being under 25 foot high saltwater storm surge for three days when the hurricane hit us. Our, our grant is coming from the Bahamas Protected Areas Fund. We are going to be planting 30,000 mangrove seedlings by December 31st, 2022. We are trying not to import mangrove seedlings from another country. So we realized that we were going to need help to be able to collect and grow 30,000 mangrove seedlings in that magnitude. So in May of 2022, we initiated a, a really cool program called Mangrove Mania. And we had the first lady, the prime minister's wife, she came and rang the bell to start the competition. And the idea is for teams to compete against each other. We were able to get three companies on the island to donate some funds so that we could offer a cash prize, actually three cash prizes. So we have teams that are right now, as we speak, gathering propagules, planting them, potting them, watering them, taking care of them in their backyard nurseries. And October 17th of this, of this year, they will start the judging. And on the 29th of October, they're going to announce the winners of the competition. Uh, but all of the backyard nurseries have now contributed at least 10,000 mangrove seedlings to our effort. So we're very close to hitting that number of 30,000. And in fact, we've already scheduled our outplanting exercises for November and December of this year. We have at least eight or nine teams that are competing in the Mangrove Mania. And actually some of the EarthCare Eco Kids decided to, to start a team. So we have our own backyard nursery and We've gotten over 2,000 seedlings in, in our nursery so far. So we're, we're hoping we're in the running, but if we're not, it was, it was a lot of fun to compete. And we're, we're hoping to continue into next year. So we're headed now to Dover Sound to do an exercise in environmental education. And we have our team, we have Talia, Rachel, and their mother, Rochelle, who is a teacher. And they've been working with EarthCare for, since they were in grade three. And we're going to plant mangroves and propagules. You saw the healthy mangroves at the Lucayan National Park. And these are the, what's left of the mangroves at Dover Sound which were under 25 feet of saltwater storm surge for at least uh, 48 hours. We're here to plant mangroves and propagules. So can anyone tell me the importance of mangroves? 
One of the importances of mangroves is that it protects the coastline against hurricanes and strong storms. Very good. It also um, provides a place for animals to live and grow. It is important for land building. Yes, the prop roots. Alex, would you like to try to plant one? I'd love to. <laughs> That's my first one. <laughs> it's really easy. Um, this is a typical mangrove propagule. And the pointed brown end is the one you want to put into the ground, approximately three inches deep. So you have the green part sticking out. Oh, it goes easy. It goes in easy. Very good. You did yeah. it. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> it's amazing though. Even the tiny ones do grow. Yes. They sprout leaves and they do just as well as the really big ones. I, I'm not really sure why that happens, but it's really an amazing part of nature. Mangrove restoration looks like a very fun activity, but do you use any guidelines or manuals? Well, in fact, we um, brought the Mangrove Action Project to train us uh, in May, no, sorry, in April. So they came from the Philippines and the UK and they've been involved in mangrove restoration for, uh, I think, at least four decades. So we were in week-long training with them, learning the do's and the don'ts, because there have been many restoration projects around the world, and some have failed really badly. Some have been uh, successful. So uh, they were teaching us what works and what doesn't work. But as a part of the grant that we got from the Bahamas Protected Areas Fund, we are mandated, we have to write a manual for NGOs and a manual for schools for the Bahamas for mangrove restoration. And the cool thing about us being able to do that is that we can fall back on the manuals that are, have been written for other countries, but as well, now we can add in our experiences locally with uh, the successes and failures of trying to start the mangroves in the Head Start program, the mangrove seedling farms that we have, the backyard nurseries. Now we know what works and what doesn't work. So at least for, for this island and by extension, hopefully our manual will be able to be used throughout the other islands of the Bahamas as well. So the Bahamas is my home, the only home I, I've known. My mother came from England um, and my father came from Guyana. And my father was uh, brought here by Wallace Groves, who is the founder of Freeport. And so my dad was surveying the island, making the, the canals. He designed the Grand Lucayan Waterway. My grandfather was hired by Wallace Groves to landscape what would become the city of Freeport. This is all in the early 50s. So when I was a little girl, I was an only child. So um, I would spend a lot of time out in the yard. I would catch tadpoles. I would grow them up into little frogs. I would get caterpillars and put them in jars and watch them turn into, feed them the leaves and watch them turn into cocoons and eventually butterflies or moths. So my mother said I was an environmentalist since I was a little girl. When I was 10, I think, my uncle took me with his friends out to Pelican Point, which is a beautiful, beautiful beach. And he would fish, commercially fish, skin dive for fish and sell them. So he and his friends, they were uh, teenagers. And so they would put a big 10-foot uh, aluminum f boat into the back of their vehicle. And we'd have a little six horsepower engine. And they had me driving the boat. So I'd have to drive the boat to each of the divers once they got a fish and they'd throw the fish into the boat. Uh, but I remember one particular day, I, the engine stopped and the, the ocean was taking me out 
away from the land. And I was screaming, Uncle David, <laughs> Uncle David. <laughs> and he, he was swimming and he was looking for fish. And so he, finally I got his attention and I was able to tell him, you know, I'm having a problem and he swam out. And that day he taught me how to pull and start the engine myself. So that never happened again. But um, that was one of my fond memories. And that was one of the reasons I, I probably ended up becoming a marine biologist was because of all those hours spent with my uncles, because all my uncles had boats and we would go and camp out at the Keys and um, they would catch lobsters and groupers and conks. And uh, so I remember most of my vivid memories of my youth were going out on fishing trips with my uncles. And when I did go to college and study environmental technology, they had just started the aquaculture program. My uncle David told me, he said, well, I said, well, I could do this program, but it would take me a few more years to finish. And he said, well, you should do it. I said, why? He said, well, we've been raping and pillaging the ocean all, this, all these years, but you could put things back into the ocean because you'll learn how to grow them and, and put them back. And so he talked me into doing the aquaculture option. And um, so that's, that's what led to my early 20s, my career in aquaculture. And look what I found. This is a beautiful mother of pearl shell. It's one of my favorites. And also some mangrove propagules. Gail, can you tell us a little bit about your college and your career? I went to FIT, Florida Institute of Technology, where I studied oceanographic technology, environmental technology, and aquaculture. So when I was in university, my advisor was trying to talk me out of going into the aquaculture option because he said it was a male-dominated field. And that just made me want to do it more. <laughs> it was sort of like a challenge for me. But when I did go in and start working in my first uh, professional job in a laboratory, um, I was told a year after I was hired, did I know why I was hired? And I, I said, because I have an aquaculture degree and experience. And um, he said, no, you were hired because you were a hard body. I said, what's a hard body? And they said, because you look good in a bikini out on the slab, um, spraying out the tanks. And I was so hurt. I was really, really, I was devastated, really. And, um, but after I processed it and thought about it for a few days, I said, you know what? I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to, I, I ended up publishing my first paper as a single author in a scientific journal. And it was some work I had done before I, I went to the lab. I just, I worked twice as hard because I knew I was competing with these males who, who were, Maybe they didn't do half the work I did, but they were getting twi paid twice as much. But um, I had to do above and beyond just to be respected because it's such a male-dominated field. Most of my early career was in aquaculture. I worked at, uh, in Florida at the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, Institution, where I major, uh, mostly grew different organisms, clams, oysters, and seaweed for energy. And then I worked at another laboratory in the Bahamas where we were raising clownfish. And then from there I moved to Australia where I worked as an algologist growing microalgae and uh, copepods and rotifers for early hatchery raised fish. Have you ever worked with uh, bigger animals? Yes, as a matter of fact, when I left Australia, I came home to my island and there wasn't any research or science related jobs, so I had to take what I could get. And I found a position as a dolphin trainer. And that was really interesting. We were training the dolphins for open ocean release to work with uh, scuba diving tourists. 
And so we were successful in that. But at the same time, I, uh, I had a, a bond with Lakaya, who was, I was assigned to work with daily. And she was what you'd call a teenage female dolphin. Um, and I could see in her eyes sometimes that she really didn't want to be in captivity and working for her food every day and having to be pet by tourists uh, at 10, 12 and 2, uh, never ending. They didn't have a day off. It was, um, you know, Monday through Sunday. And the only way they got their food was to do these behaviors for, for the paying tourists. And um, eventually there were some pollution problems with the area that we were at because there was a sewage plant that was, was releasing at night untreated sewage. So when I sent, sent in my resignation, um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be a party to their captivity anymore. I just, I, my heart was breaking to see them in that situation because I realized that they swim 40 miles a day in family units with grandmothers and uh, mothers and, and the kids and they're, they're sentient beings and they, they don't deserve to be in a 90 foot pen being pet by tourists three times a day. What, uh, on my first day as a dolphin trainer, was photographing a necropsy, which is the autopsy of a dead dolphin. And what struck me was that the organs were so similar to a human, the lungs, the heart, all the in inter internal organs were so similar. The only thing different was where they breathed, the blowhole, and that they didn't have arms and legs. So that really struck me and stuck with me throughout my time there. And um, I grew to understand that they're very intelligent and uh, very sensitive beings and don't deserve to be in captivity, for sure. Killer whales, dolphins, any, any marine mammal, uh, they should be in the, in the wild. The whole reason I started to concentrate mainly on young people was because I was asked to talk at a lot of different civil society groups. And I was, uh, I remember talking about cruise ship dumping because one of the bonefish guides had found big bags of cruise ship waste that actually had the cruise ship's logo in the waste. And it was washing up on Xanadu Beach. And um, so he reported it to the Freeport News. And so I was trying to, I was giving speeches about the fact that we needed to up the penalty for cruise ships dumping waste. So, because at that time, I think the fine was $500. So uh, that's nothing for a cruise ship <laughs> company. And so I remember getting quite a good response from this one particular group that I spoke to. And as I was driving out after the luncheon meeting, um, I was behind one of the persons who was in the group. And they were throwing out Kentucky Fried Chicken boxes onto the side of the road. And I was so mortified. I was so upset. I, I vowed at that moment that I wasn't going to talk to grown-ups anymore. I was only going to talk to children because I, I gave up on the adults. <laughs> because it was just, oh, I couldn't believe it. So that, that was the main reason I started to concentrate on the youth. And uh, I remember that as a very pivotal moment for me. <laughs> they were, oh, I was so angry. But we have, what we've done with Earth Care is uh, we've, we started the Earth Care Eco Kids program probably oh, six or eight years ago, I think. And we were working in conjunction with Save the Bays. Um, and basically what we would do is take a topic of the day, be it pollution, invasive species, cl the climate crisis, uh, sustainable fisheries, and we would have like an hour presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, and then we would take the, the group on a bus to do a fun field trip to reinforce the issue. So that was um, 
pivotal, figuring out that rather than just give them a lecture and let them go, giving them an experience that reinforced the topic was so much more impactful than just saying, you know, this is this and this is that, and then letting them go. That, that, they'll just, it'll just go in one ear and out the other. So I remember we went to the Lucayan National Park. We were teaching about um, mangroves and the importance of mangroves. We did several uh, fun exercises. We did um, the water cycle races. So the kids would basically be taking cups of water and doing a relay race. So, and taking cups of water and putting it in an empty bucket and then having to bring the cup back to the other person. And so that was quite a competition. And the, it, the, we did that with the, the younger kids. They, they really enjoy that. And then um, we do the food web uh, game, which you have a lot of different strings and each string is a different part of the food web. And you get, get to see how, how interconnected everything is. But we were also able to teach them how to do some citizen science, how to use a refractometer, how to put the water on and then see what the salinity of the water is. And we'll be doing that when we're out planting the mangroves because the salinity that we're putting the, the mangroves into is very important. And so that's something we'll need to record as well as we'll be recording temperatures and uh, of course, you know, how many leaves are on each plant that we're planting out. It's very important for the children to realize that we're not just doing an exercise to do the exercise. We're actually taking down scientific data and we're, we're doing citizen science and helping, helping research and helping pla the planet. We used to meet every second Saturday, but this year we've been meeting every Saturday because uh, we've just got so many different projects we're working on. So this is the cave where I usually teach my Earthcare Eco kids about sea level rise because you can see the stratification in the walls of the cave where the water has gone up and down. And so it's easier for them to think of sea level rise over, over eons of time because you can see it physically in the cave. And it's, I find it very fascinating. And to think that the early Lucayan Indians and the Arawak Indians used this type of uh, geologic formation to live in, shelter, probably cooking. And uh, it's amazing. Do you involve younger uh, students in policy making? Yes, it's, it's really important. Um, when one of the main things that we do is when we go into a classroom with the students and teachers, we encourage them to see if there's some sort of environmental issue that they're, uh, they feel strongly about. And then we encourage them to, as a class, write letters to whichever ministry is the one that would be in charge of that problem and making their voice known and empowering themselves by, you know, making the government aware that there's a problem. And in turn, that empowers the, the students and the teachers to use their voice. And that, that is a main um, mission of Earth Care is to empower people to use their voice as far as it regards the environment of the Bahamas and the environment of the world. So uh, usually the teachers that we visit um, always ask for us to do a hands-on activity with their class and for, for instance I spoke to the Lukaya International School twice last year and I was able to give them Vice President Al Gore's climate reality leadership slideshow. And that's very impactful because I, I finished his training in 2021. And so because of that, the teachers now have engaged me to 
give their classes activities that they can go out and do in the community, whether it's helping us with mangroves or whether it's doing a beach cleanup. And so, in fact, the principal now has told me that I, ha I have to um, make some more activities for this year. We did the International Coastal Cleanup with that particular school and they're very, they're, uh, they actually have eco club status. We have, I think, three schools that have qualified internationally as uh, eco schools. So they have the eco flag. And um, in fact, Bishop Michael Eldon, they just got, uh, I think, a $50,000 grant for their hydroponics program, which is part of their eco, eco club. Also, we banned plastics in January 2020, the country of the Bahamas. We, uh, there was a group of youthful people led by Crystal Ambrose, and she had a group that was focused on plastics and the harm they can cause in the environment. And she and her kids went and visited the environment minister and made their presentation. And the environment minister ended up writing the legislation banning single-use plastics, uh, the food containers, the forks and knives, um, and uh, plastic cups. So, and also plastic bags. And also with that le legislation, he also banned the releasing of balloons into the environment. So there's a hefty fine for that. I think it's $2,000 if you're caught releasing balloons. So now we've had to adapt. We bring our cloth bags when we're shopping and um, we're, we're, we're pretty much ahead of the game as far as that because I know EarthCare is right now working with uh, groups, civil groups from throughout the world trying to help write the plastics treaty with the United Nations. So. Um, with that, we're trying to get uh, good rules for the plastic pickers and uh, environmental justice for people who are working in that field, as well as trying to make sure the, the people who are trying to soften the, the treaty as far as they don't want plastics to be banned out, outright. Um, so we're working in that regard. I know in certain realms we need plastic in medical devices. We need plastic, you know, for giving blood transfusions and that sort of thing. So we don't want an outright ban. We, we just want for as, as far as to try to minimize the amount of waste that goes into the, the landfills or the dumps or ends up in the ocean. The things that don't really need to, you know, using a fork once and then throwing it away and it takes a thousand years to, to break down, that's, that's pretty crazy. And we've been doing that for decades. As well, the problem of microplastics. When the plastics break down in places like the ocean, um, they become little spheres and they actually have more a greater surface area. So with that greater surface area, they actually attract POPs or persistent organic pollutants, which are at times very harmful to humans and, and any creatures actually. And they will build up in your system, which is not good. So they've documented that we've got microplastics in the rain, it's in the soil, it's in the ocean. And more recently in April and May of this year, uh, it's been shown that they've, scientists have found microplastics in human blood. So it's a serious problem that we need to address before, before it gets any worse. So with our Earth Care Eco Kids program, the, the students do get community service hours, which is something that's required in the Bahamas. So for junior high and high school students, in order to graduate, they have to have a certain number of community service hours where they can show they did something positive for our community. So 
Um, in 2020, our first activity after the pandemic shutdown was over uh, was to build a community garden. So many of our students came and helped with that. Um, they got a lot of community service hours. Every Saturday morning, we were uh, planting seeds, we were watering, we were planting bananas and uh, pineapples and all sorts of everything you can think of that you can grow in a garden, we were planting. So, and we were able to donate organic vegetables to the hospital, to the old folks home and to the children's home. So that was really, really a great project. And also we were able to start Constructive Visions, which started from one of my colleagues from my Cornell course, uh, Michael Schrenk. He's from South Africa. He works with youth in South Africa. So he sent me an email because uh, Michael and Dr. Krasny and I were on a podcast called Silver Linings of Education, I think. I, I probably got the title wrong, but uh, we did this podcast. And so after the podcast, Michael sent me an email and said he's working on this Constructive Visions project. Would I be interested? And I said, well, tell me more. So it turns out there was 50 National Ge Geographic explorers who got together and wrote a fictional story, a book, about what the world would be like after the pandemic if the world does the right things to make the world a sustainable place. The aim of the project, he got, I think, 70 NGOs around the world to participate, educational NGOs. So um, this is before the book was published. So they would issue us the chapters and we would do get a group of students to uh, go through the chapters with them. We'd read the chapters together. So after we did our mangrove measuring, my, my group would we'd read a chapter from Constructive Visions. And, but before we started the project, we had to do a survey. They had to do a survey. So the survey was basically uh, ascertaining their level of anxiety about the future um, before reading the book because the book is supposed to, you know, make them feel better about the future because everyone knows with the climate crisis, people are a little worried about what's going to happen in the future. So we did the beginning, the, the initial survey. And then, so that was November, 2021. And we ended in February, 2022, where I gave them the final survey, which would ascertain if their level of anxiety was less after reading the chapters that we were able to read. So we were supposed to read three chapters, but we were able, since we were meeting every Saturday, we got to read more. So uh, thankfully the kids were less anxious about the future. They were more hopeful. They felt like they had more empowerment. So we, We've stuck with the project. We're still working with Constructive Visions. Um, we just, as a group, uh, applied for an, another grant from National Geographic, and we were just told we got it. So each of the participating NGOs is going to get a little bit of money to continue the work. How has EarthCare involved local communities more in environmental policy making and political engagement? Well. We've done it in several ways. Uh, when we had the SWAT grant, which was saving the world's ocean turtles, um, we encouraged schools, we would visit schools and encourage the students to write to the Ministry of Fisheries to ask them to uh, stiffen the laws about protecting the endangered sea turtles, which they did. and. Uh, the, uh, a year or two later, another campaign called Save Our Turtles was started in Nassau. And that campaign in conjunction was able to get the government to make the Bahamas a sanctuary for endangered sea turtles. So all seven species of turtles are now protected in the Bahamas. You can't kill them. Another way we go, we engage people in civ civic engagement is we had a mining company on the island that was 
uh, using their blasting and it was causing people's houses to crack up and uh, get d damage. So we actually went door to door talking to people in the community and inviting them to public town meetings and asking them to sign petitions. So there's that kind of campaigning. And then the last one, which is a uh, last resort, is to do a demonstration. In 1993, we did three days of sustained dis demonstrations against longline fishing, which the Minister of Fisheries was trying to uh, promote. He was going to bring in 23 longline vessels and each vessel would have a 60 mile long line. They were going to target um, sharks for shark fins. We had a, a campaign over the summer and then at Thanksgiving, um, a tourist party had a bad experience with a longline fishing boat and that ended up making me apply for the permit to demonstrate in December. And on the third day of our sustained demonstrations, the Prime Minister came out and actually invited us into the House of Assembly to hear him ban longline fishing. So that was a successful campaign that we are very proud of. Do you have any advice for young people today who are interested in solving environmental issues, very big environmental problems? Yes, I actually uh, did a YouTube video for an NGO in India on this very same question. And uh, basically my message is for them to find in their hearts what sort of, uh, which type of environmental way they want to go and then look for universities that are, uh, are dealing in that aspect of the environment and then to write as many of the universities as possible and try to get scholarships. There's countries that are willing to give scholarships. So what I've actually been encouraging people to do is to try to network as much as possible. A lot of students aren't aware that universities have money they want to give away so that they can get the brightest, the best and brightest students. So a lot of students will maybe think, oh, well, I don't have the money to go away to a four year college. Whereas there are many free rides that they can get. And by keeping the grades up and being focused, doing community engagement work, working with different aspects, maybe if it's a community garden or a beach cleanup or helping uh, an NGO do some sort of project, the connections that they make there, they meet people like Kai met you yesterday and you were telling her about Cornell University and the opportunities there. For the kids to engage with different entities and learn about the different opportunities, it's so important because we, we've got to, as, as young people grow into adults, they've got to learn to be resilient and adapt to climate change. And they can use, whether they want to be a politician or a doctor or a lawyer or a, or a teacher, all of those jobs, they will still have to deal with the aspects of climate change. So it's very important that they, they get a good basis of environmental knowledge to take them into the future. Do you know some of the main reasons why adults and other community members volunteer their time to participate in a mangrove forest restoration and your other projects? What are the main reasons, motives? Well, we've always been a community that's been environmentally minded. Uh, we've had, we, we started our ecotourism committee in 1988 and um, we've been trying to, uh, to sensitize the whole community, the whole nation actually, about why the environment is important and how integral it is to our, our main um, industry, which is tourism. The, the people who come to visit 
you know, aren't coming to see skyscrapers. They're coming to see our beautiful beaches and the environments that, that are unique to the Bahamas. But the adults who are uh, volunteering are, have, have been through, seen the devastation that the climate change Hurricane Dorian could do to our island. And they really want to help. And, and they've understood through our uh, outreach and education that the mangroves are so important to protecting the island from big storms like this and important for our fisheries and important for land building. So I think the outreach and um, the television stories, the news stories that we've done have, have made a big impact on adults in particular who now realize how important the mangroves are and they really, really want to help. And they understand that we've, we've taken on this huge demand of the planting 30,000 mangroves. So, and they realize that our small groups can't do it alone. And so we're just so happy that the community members are stepping up and uh, offering to help. We have help from Rotary and Kiwanis and all sorts of civil society organizations that normally wouldn't really be doing this kind of work. Uh, those people who retired, do you feel like they have a sense of community when they come to volunteer? The, uh, we have um, one of my most avid members is Jill Cooper. She's our earth care nursery manager. She's 78 and she never says no to anything I ask of her. Anything she can do to help. She has this great sense of community, great sense of place. She loves this island and uh, even though it's not where she was born, but she came here from uh, via UK and Canada and ended up marrying a Bahamian and she's embraced Grand Bahama as her home. So her sense of place and her sense of community is so strong. I, I, I'm so thankful that she helps us. Here we are at the Earth Care Mangrove Manian Nursery and it's only thanks to our faithful member, Earth Care member, Jill Cooper. She has been active with us for many years and she volunteered her backyard for our nursery. And this is Jill's grandson. Hi. He's been uh, watering all the mangroves for us every day. So this, these are our first mangroves. We started with the black mangrove and then these are red mangroves. So we've got the propagules and some of them are getting their leaves. Yeah, we should, we should probably water them before we leave. So Alex, I wanted to show you what we're doing here in the mangrove nursery. So we put in the propagule and as they grow, the first thing you'll see are the two leaves sprouting. And then once we get four leaves, like in this one, then that one is ready to be outplanted into the restoration area. EarthCare is a part of the Grand Bahama Island Birders, which is our local birding group. And that group is very active with the Cornell Orth Ornithology Lab. Whenever we go birding, we log our sightings on eBird and we participate in all of their activities, Global Big Day. Um, we just did the World Shorebird Count and October 8th we'll be doing uh, World Migratory Bird Day. So we'll have teams going to various parts of the island and we will be using our citizen science and counting all the birds we see, making sure we know each species and entering it all into the eBird uh, app that Cornell Ornithology Lab has. Hi, my name is Dolores Kelman and I am the president of Grand Bahama Island Birders, a local birding group here on the island. And we just wrapped up our World Migratory Day bird activity with Earth Care, hosted by Gail Vaughan, who is the president of Earth Care, and Bridget Davis, one of our members, who presented a small talk on World Migratory Bird Day, which has been celebrated under the theme, Dim the Lights for Birds at Night. And being a retired teacher, what I have here in my hand are some pamphlets 
with information on this year's theme that I'll be taking to three junior high schools on Monday so that we would get them interested in birding and know how to protect the birds that pass through our island twice a year. And many of the people who are in the birding group are actually Earth Care members, so they in turn work uh, with our other projects where we, when we have beach cleanups, they help. For Dolphin Day, we did a global beach cleanup because dolphins and whales need clean oceans to live. So our group did that activity. And then we did the island-wide international coastal cleanup. So I was zone captain for Gold Rock Beach at Lucayan National Park. And my team was 31 volunteers from various places. We had Lucaya International School, Bishop Michael Eldon School, we had teachers, we had parents, we had, we had an infant actually with us, and uh, then we had Earth Care volunteers as well. So we got 300 pounds of marine debris that we removed from the National Park. We're starting to lobby the Bahamas government and the Bahamas National Trust to see if the Bahamas would agree to become the first Atlantic shark sanctuary, Atlantic Ocean shark sanctuary. So my daughter uh, had done a great science project and she, I got a call from someone from the Bahamas National Trust who was in Abaco and she said that Pierre Cousteau wanted to meet my daughter. And I said, why does Pierre Cousteau want to meet my daughter? And she said, well, we heard about her shark project. I said, I didn't tell anyone about her shark project. She said, we're a small conservation community. <laughs> and I said, we must be. <laughs> so um, Pierre stayed in the hotel across the street. And my daughter was very shy. She, she was only 13. She said, I don't want to meet uh, someone about my shark project. I said, you don't understand. This is the son of the father of oceanography basically. Jacques Cousteau is the reason I became a marine biologist and I said you you don't have a choice you have to go meet this man and so I took her we took the project and she showed him all about what she'd learned because she'd gone to the shark lab in Bimini the Bimini biological station for research and she learned all about their shark tagging uh, systems she went in the water with sharks and she she learned how to put them into tonic immobility. And so she explained all this to Pierre Cousteau. And the next day, the next night, Pierre had to give a, a talk at the Rand Nature Center about why the Bahamas should become a shark sanctuary. And at the end, of, when it was question and answer, a student from Candace's school came up and asked about sharks and how they breathe and is it true they can't stop swimming to breathe. If they stop swimming, they can't breathe. And he, he said, well, there's someone here who can answer that better than me. And he called my daughter up to the microphone and she had to answer the question for him. I'd say probably six months after that meeting, the Bahamas announced that the sh we would be a sanctuary for sharks. So now all the sharks, the endangered sharks of the world are safe in the Bahamas. They can't be killed. We're we're trying to be an eco-sensitive country. So here I am coming to Lukaya National Park and happen to run into my great friend, Shami Roll. Uh, we just finished uh, doing a cave dive. Can you show my audience your, your claim to fame, the Caribbean <laughs> reef shark bite? I don't know if it's claim to fame, but yes, it's a uh, Caribbean reef sharks feed that took place here on Grand Bahama. So it's from my elbow to my wrist. It was not the shark fault. We tend to blame the animals for things. Actually, a really cool experience until the bite. And now you're back to what you love, which is taking people out into the caverns and the mangroves. I hope that you call me in and, and use me if you like. Uh, you know, I have the kayaks. Well, so, thank yes, you, Shami. You are so welcome. Will you please share with us your experience of Hurricane Dorian? Well, um, I've been made homeless three times by climate change hurricanes before Hurricane Dorian. 
So I have what you call PTSD. So when a hurricane is approaching, I get very anxious and um, uh, very worried. So when I saw the magnitude of Hurricane Dorian and how it was headed straight for this island, um, I got very nervous. I was contacted by a reporter in Nassau and she did a story about Grand Bahama preparing and she asked me to do uh, a, a video. It was the first time I did a video on my phone, uh, send it to her news station in Nassau where I was talking about having PTSD and how uh, it was affecting me trying to prepare for the storm. The morning the storm was supposed to hit, uh, I was contacted by another news station, uh, ZNS, and they asked me to speak about the storm surge, which at that time was forecast to be 15 feet high, uh, saltwater storm surge. So I spoke about that and I urged everyone to on the coast to move inland away from the coastline because 15 feet high is higher than your house. So as well, we were in king tides. The hurricane was forecast to be with us 24 hours. So that would have meant two tide cycles where the storm surge would have been higher than 15 feet. So that was a, a problem. And so that news story aired in the afternoon on television and radio and when my daughter and I were in the shelter. So the reporter who had initially contacted me was writing for the Washington Post. And she asked if she could call me throughout the storm. So I said, sure. She called me three times. Uh, the storm was over us for three days. It was a category five. It basically got to our island and just stayed there. So 70% of Grand Bahama Island was under 25 foot high storm surge, saltwater storm surge for three days. The first time the reporter called me, it was fine. Everything was fine. The second time she called me, the roof had come off the shelter and we were downstairs, water was pouring in, we were trying to figure out what to do. And I said, I'm a little agitated right now. And then uh, she called me again later and I didn't realize she was writing articles which were being published as we were going through the storm. Uh, I found out later, I got to read them. So all the shelters around us were failing. Uh, we were moved into a church next door and we went from 40 people to 300 in 12 hours. Uh, we had people from the, the medical shelter, people who had diabetes and conditions, high blood pressure, Alzheimer's, because that shelter and our hospital had flooded. There was five feet of salt water in the hospital. So the patients in the hospital had to be moved. What we didn't know was that at the same time, the properties over the bridge were all being flooded and at the eastern end of the island was just underwater. Buildings and families were washed away. It was horrific, the damage. But one thing I can tell you about the mangroves, there was a community on the eastern end, a little key called Sweetings Key, had a very healthy mangrove forest. Some person selected to stay there. While they lost some buildings, uh, they didn't have any loss of life. But right across the water, another settlement where they had uh, not very many mangroves around that had massive loss of life. So another reason the mangroves are important is protection from hurricanes. Oh, in addition, I didn't mention, I was in contact with my Cornell uh, climate change fellows through the WhatsApp. So Marianne Krasny and my other colleagues were basically going through the storm with me. They were praying for us. They were uh, asking me for updates and I was telling them, okay, well, you know, this has happened and that has happened. So I can't thank them enough. They, they kept me sane throughout this worrisome time. But when, when the flooding was happening, people were calling for rescue because people were climbing into their roofs, trying to get away from the water. People were climbing up trees and holding onto trees. So there was a group of, I'm not sure how many, I think four or five people who had jet skis and they went to try to save people. And they were going house to house and getting people 
out of their roofs and taking them to higher ground. They did try to rescue uh, a friend of mine who he and his wife were trapped, but they couldn't get to the house because of all the broken timber that, ha that was floating. It had blocked the house. Unfortunately, he, my friend's wife was washed away. And when he was rescued, he, when he came conscious at the hospital, he asked for his wife. And when they told him that, they, that she was lost and they don't know where she is, he had a massive heart attack and he died. So the two of them both were fatalities of the hurricane. My boyfriend had to evacuate the house. He was staying with the pets and uh, the neighbor came to knock on the door and said, uh, the water's coming, you need to, to come with us. And so he let the dog out because we had separated the dogs and the cats. And then he got his laptop and valuables. And so when he opened the door to the neighbor, the water was ankle deep. Just during that 60 seconds he took to get his things and came back out, the water was thigh high. They had to run two blocks through the water to the car that was waiting outside the water. And eventually he was taken to our shelter. And when he came in, I knew not to say anything for two hours because the look on his face, he was, you know, traumatized. And he told us later that it was looked like it was raining and the rain was hitting him, but it was salt water. It wasn't rain. It was the, the, the storm surge was being picked up by the winds and then dropped down again. What was the recovery process for the local community? Ooh, the recovery was hard because um, first people were still trying to get out east to rescue whoever they could, but the roads were all destroyed. So after the storm left, uh, everyone went home to see the damages. Many houses, you know, had salt water inside. Mine only had, thankfully, six inches inside, 18 inches outside. But we had, um, we had insulated the doors and the windows, so we got less water inside, thankfully. But we still had to replace all of the walls in the inside of the house. But every day, uh, my cars were destroyed. I just bought my car, my daughter a car as her graduation present. She got to drive it for two weeks and the storm came and destroyed her car. So um, I would ride my bike into the town to the, uh, the hurricane center and you had to fill out your paperwork with social services and to the various departments that were going, giving out aid. And then World Central Kitchen came and they were a godsend. They stayed with us for a year. They were cooking meals for people every day. We, we at least had hot meals. Um, and we had no power for, I believe it was six weeks. And the water coming out of the tap was now salty because of the the storm surge had caused saltwater intrusion into our freshwater lens, the groundwater, which was the source of our city water. So now, three years later, we still don't have uh, potable water coming out of our taps. We would have helicopters, U.S. Coast Guard helicopters flying past all the time. One day I heard them and Two landed in the, the high school field right across the street from my house. And they had come to pick up a pregnant lady who was ready to deliver, to take her to Nassau, because we had no hospital. S Samaritan's Purse came. They have like blow up tents and they set up medical centers, doctors, nurses. And we had them with us for over a year because it took a long time for our hospital to be reopened. And we had NGOs from all over the world who came in and Christian organizations, they came in and they were helping people put tarps on the roofs, um, helping people to treat for mold. Uh, we took a workshop from an NGO that taught us how to properly treat the black mold. And uh, so we did the job ourselves and then we were able to put in our drywall ourselves. 
but it's not something I want to repeat ever. And look what I found. This is a beautiful mother of pearl shell. It's one of my favorites. And also some mangrove propagules. Gail, your organization is doing so much to help save these islands from climate change through advocacy, stewardship and education. Do you think that your work and your projects will be effective in, in the long run? Oh, that's my sincere hope. Um, but to really draw down climate change is going to take a concerted effort from the larger countries than the Bahamas, the big polluters like US, India, China, until they embrace the idea that fossil fuels are not the answer. Uh, unfortunately, small island developing states like the Bahamas, we're still going to be vulnerable to sea level rise, the he heavy storms that climate change causes. So unfortunately, the Bahamas can do everything that we've been doing and more, but we're so small in the, in the global uh, landscape that it's going to take major changes in, in the bigger countries that are the main polluters for it to have a great impact on us. So I'm just really advocating that the young people become resilient and learn to adapt I see a lot of the people since the past more frequent hurricanes that we've been having are now rebuilding their houses on stilts. So uh, they're rebuilding them at a, so you live on the second floor, not on the ground floor, because we're realizing the when storm surge comes, it's basically wiping out the first floor of every building. We've had to rebuild our airport twice um, and we now, at this point, don't have a proper airport because of previous storms. We, as a community, as a country, have to adapt and be resilient and, and learn how to change our building codes and maybe even think about the future like Vanuatu and some of the other low-lying countries. I think one of them has bought inland country land the size of their country in another country so that their people can move when they become climate refugees, when the sea level rise goes over their islands. So it's, it's, it's heartbreaking for me because if, if the, the countries that need to make the changes don't make the changes, there's a good possibility that 100 years from now the Bahamas might be underwater. However, um, there is hope. I was able to do a climate change fellowship with Cornell University. Uh, I think it was in 2018. And I was able to work with people from countries uh, all over the world. And we all decided that there is hope. And through our environmental education, we're giving people the power to make individual choices that can help draw down climate change. So if you change your diet, or if you change uh, how you get around, if you use public transportation instead of driving uh, a car when you only have one person in the car, uh, maybe switch to an electric vehicle. So there's many things, or use LED bulbs, many things that we're teaching people to do on an individual level that can help draw down climate change. I see a lot of impact with Earth Care Eco Kids. Um, some of my students, in fact, I have uh, Havana and Savannah Gibson. They graduated last year. They are going into environmental science. And I had had them since I think grade seven. So and then we have Rochelle, Manchester and her sister Tylea. Rochelle is going to a university in Hawaii. She's going to be studying environmental science as well. Alana Velicott. She was one of my Earth Care Eco kids since she was a, a little girl 
and she was doing the international coastal cleanup with us for the years of her growing up. She's grown into a beautiful woman now and she went away and studied ecology and she is now an environmental scientist, marine biologist, as well as coral restoration specialist at Coral Vita. I couldn't be more proud. We are just coming out of Coral Vita and who do we run into? But Alana Vallecott and she is the coral restoration specialist for Coral Vita as well as she was one of my Earth Care Eco Kids when, back when we started. And um, she's gone on to become an environmental scientist and a marine biologist and many other things. Uh, star of series and model and influencer. So how are you, Alana? I'm good. <laughs> I'm good with just coming to the farm to do a couple of farm checks to make sure everything was running properly, um, perform a few kind of maintenance tasks, and then head on to brunch, which is why I'm kind of dressed like this. I'm meeting up you with look beautiful. Our, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> meeting up with our former director of restoration science. Uh -huh. Today is just a regular kind of peek in at the farm, make sure everything is working, because corals don't have a weekend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Yes. Do you have any specific advice for community organizers and environmental educators about how to involve community members in environmental education and environmental action? Well, um, one of the things that we, EarthCare, has been able to utilize well is uh, the media. So when we take on a campaign, we will do a press conference. And if the press doesn't come, we issue a press release and uh, send it out by email so that hopefully the, the issue or whatever it is we're talking about will be seen either in the newspapers or on social media and or television. Television news is a big thing in the Bahamas um, and all of the television newscasts are on YouTube and Facebook. That's a really good way to alert the community that there is a project. And then uh, I think that's our most effective way. And then once we've done that, we usually can be invited to speak to a civil society organization like Rotary or Kiwanis or other conservation organizations. So that in turn gets the word out. But one of the other key things is, is we have quite a big amount of different environmental organizations on each of the islands. So what we've really found useful is for when there's a project that we can work on together, we contact each other and um, we get together and instead of one organization saying, I'm doing this activity I'm, and it's a, our, we are the sole sponsor of this activity. Uh, like with Mangrove Mania, we've got at least four environmental organizations partnering together and we're working together on the same project. And so with the same many hands make light work. And in the publicity that has been generated about the mangrove restoration project for Dover Sound, now we have companies on the island, which heretofore before was rare to have private companies want to get involved. So uh, last month, we had 30 employees, staff from the Grand Bahama Power Company, came out to the mangrove farm that you saw yesterday. And they, they planted, they measured and planted 1,000 mangrove propagules in two hours. So things like that, I don't think would happen unless we had our, our, our public media campaign and through that, we're contacted by various entities who want to get involved because we're engaging the community in such a way that everyone is on board. And it's so, it's just makes my heart feel good to know that people care. Ocean, sky, white sand, birds, palm trees. What does this place mean? to you, Gail? Oh, 
Oh, well, it's my heart. I, uh, I grew up here. This is my, the only home I've ever known. And I didn't realize until I went to college that other places didn't have the blue, beautiful blue ocean that we have or uh, the clean air and the, the nature that, that we have. It wasn't until I went to university, I said, oh my goodness, this river that they think is wonderful, you, can't e you put your hand in the water, you can't even see your hand. It was brown from the tannins and the lignans, and uh, they thought that was normal. And I, I was uh, astounded that they were just accepting that that's a normal color for a river, and found out I ended up doing a Creel census during my time at school, which was basically you ask fishers about how they fish and the different ways they fish. And I met a bridge tender when I was doing this. I was doing it from Fort Pierce all the way down to the Keys. So I met a bridge tender in Fort Pierce and he told me, he said, I used to fish this river in the 1940s. He said, it used to be clear like the water in the Bahamas. I said, really? He said, yes, they had conchs, they had all kinds of tropical things that you'd find in the Bahamas in this river. And I was aghast, I couldn't believe it. So that told me that in the, the overdevelopment of Florida, because of they, they've just had so many people come there and they have the agriculture, the industrial agriculture, the sugar and all of that, that they've allowed that beautiful river to, to just become polluted. And now, um, this year, they've had to try to feed the manatees lettuce because the water bodies are so polluted that the seagrass can't live. So the seagrasses have died, and that's the main uh, thing that the manatees like to eat. So it's heartbreaking to see the manatees are trying to actually get out of the water to try to find vegetation that they can eat. And there, some of them are emaciated. It's just, I, I don't understand. The state of Florida has so many departments that they know the science, they know what needs to be done and they re keep refusing to do it because of political lobbies and uh, it's a shame because now it's affecting people's health. But getting back to the Bahamas, um, just the entire environment that I grew up in, uh, we have the cave systems and the uh, wonderful ocean, which I grew up on my uncle's fishing boats. We would go out fishing uh, on the weekends and I grew up on these boats and that gave me a real sense of place in that I felt like my place was on the ocean. I, the, the ocean was me, I was the ocean. In doing that experience and experiencing that, it's really given me a love for it such that I just want to share it with everyone and, and hope that everyone shares my, my sense of place. Gail, do you have any recommendations for books, fiction, and non-fiction? Well, I'm currently reading Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and I'm really enjoying it. It's, she's speaking from her experience as a Native American, and it's, it's really, really uh, impactful. Um, as far as fiction, my favorite books are uh, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. <laughs> I'm a, uh, just, I just love Tolkien. Why? <sighs> well, when I was a kid, I had um, a, a, a kidney problem and I had to go to the Miami to the hospital every month. And so this is like grade four and grade five. And at the time, books were duty free. So my mother encouraged me to buy as many books as possible, not toys, because she, with toys, she'd have to pay a customs duty. So she said, I can get as many books as, as I want, since she, that was free. 
So I would, um, I would stock up on books. Our suitcase would be full of books. And so and being an only child, when I wasn't in the yard playing with butterflies or catching tadpoles, I was reading. And when I found Tolkien's books, I read them over and over. They were just, he, he would build the world in such a way that you could see it. You could picture it because his descriptions were so intricate and he had maps and he had, he actually made languages of, for the elves and the, the different, uh, because he was a language professor. And I just thought it's so fascinating. And I even read the books that he didn't finish, like the Silmarillion and some of the other books. Anything by Tolkien I could get my hands on, I would read. Do you think that it, reading books like this helps improve our sensitivity for and understanding the real world around us? Yes, definitely. If you look at the Lord of the Rings, the, the films by Peter Jackson, uh, one of the tenets of Tolkien's work was being against environmental destruction. When, when the hobbits go into Fangorn Forest and they're picked up by the ants, which is uh, a giant tree that walks and talks, and the trees come back and go against Saruman, who is actually chopping down and burning all the trees so that he can make war machines to help with the, the battle that was going to come in later on in the book. So the trees rose up and, and basically got rid of that wizard who was doing the environmental destruction. And so I thought that was a great environmental story. You know, even though, you know, it was fiction, it was just for me great that the trees were getting back at the guy who was burning them down and cutting them down. It was fantastic. Gail, I wonder what is your relation with art? Oh, well, my daughter and I, we have quite a, a great relationship. Um, we started uh, working on plays. Uh, I, I was in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I had green hair for three days. I was the mock turtle, had to sing a solo. And then we were, she, my daughter was in fame. Uh, we were in Greece together. Um, and I was in several productions. One actually went to Nassau and was shown at the University of the Bahamas. So that was my first time traveling as a theater actor. And um, we also paint. I, I paint natural things. Uh, usually I, I, photography is my hobby. So I usually take a picture I really like and paint it. So the first painting I sold was a green heron. And, but the apex of my arts career was probably working for Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean films. And there I started as a production assistant, but was promoted to production secretary. And I worked on those films for a year. So my name is on the credits of Pirates 2 and Pirates 3. And I hope I get to work on more films in the future. Five words that describe Gail Woon. Oh gosh. Long hair. <laughs> oh, my partner says I, the reason he uh, took me on as his girlfriend was that I was selfless. And I didn't know what that meant. So he had to explain it to me. But I, I guess that that would be a word. Um, I, I just, I enjoy life. So I think every day that we're alive, if we can do something good for people, that's a good thing. Two more. Two more. Um, honest to a fault. <laughs> I, sometimes I tell people what they don't want to hear. Um, and uh, I, I'd say optimistic, optimistic. Why are you optimistic? I'm optimistic because I get, I get really jazzed. I get, I get so much energy from the youth that I work with. 
these these young people are so they're just so smart and and they know what they want and they know how to get it and they they just make me so happy to know that they're going to be taking our future in their hands and and um, hopefully when I I'm teaching them about adapt adaptation and resilience and uh, the different things we can do to draw down climate change that that I feel like once we have the future in their hands we're going to be we're going to be well because they're not going to do what we did and leave them a mess because basically we're my generation is leaving them a mess and and I, I really feel that they're going to clean up the mess what brings me joy is having a session where my students when they come away at the end of the day I can see a light in their eye that they've taken the message of the day and have taken it to heart I always tell my friends that you know, they say, well, why, why are you doing all this work every day, every weekend with the children? Why don't you take a weekend and, and just, you know, take, take time for yourself? I said, but you don't understand. I, I get more from the kids than, than I'm giving to them. They give me joy when I realize that they've understood what it is I've been trying to tell them. And then when I realize that they get it, that they they have to become more resilient. They have to adapt to climate change. They have to, um, if they're going to be a doctor, if they're going to be a politician, or if they're going to be a teacher, they're going to have to think about the future and how we can make it a more sustainable world to live in, like the Constructive Visions book has, has taught us that, um, so when, once I see that my kids get that message, that gives me joy. What are some of the main messages that Earth Care is sending to the world, to people, to communities? Well, our, our main mission is to, like I said, uh, have teachers and students empowered to use their voice, but on top of that, we're hoping that people develop compassion for one another and the earth because it's, it's just critical at this time, at this time in, that we are in that we all need to understand how important the health of our planet is. And at this point, we're seeing so many disasters happen because of climate change and so the the more we can develop uh, love for the environment and work together as communities engaging each other teaching each other about having a sense of place a sense of community um, that is key and if we can all do that together and adapt, be resilient, uh, learn to love one another, take care of each other, and mainly take care of each other because, you know, my community has been shattered by our experiences with Hurricane Dorian, and some people have chosen to leave and not come back. Um, but the ones who have stayed, we're, we're so sensitive to each other's feelings. We know what can trigger us. And so we're very careful about our speech and how we speak to one another. And we're quick to give a hug and we understand we all have a little bit of hurt somewhere. And that I think that enhances our sense of community that we went through a, a disaster together and we came out the other side and we're still alive and we're, we're able to love one another. And I think that's the main message of Earth Care is that we need to love one another.